Hello, and welcome to another edition of Between Two Outs. I'm your host, Tom Price, and with us today is Dr. Susan Jansen Varnum. She is the Senior Associate Dean in the College of Science and Technology, uh, a faculty member in the Department of Chemistry, and she also um, manages our TU Teach programs. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tom. Uh, just to make it easy, I'm just Sue. <laughs> okay, Sue, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, St. Louis, Missouri area and had a lot of experience in and around the city. So um, kind of for fun, uh, my maternal grandmother lived in North St. Louis, very much like North Philadelphia. So we had a wonderful city experience exploring things, um, the corner store, all sorts of fun stuff like that, playing bottle caps in an alley. Okay. And then my uh, grandparents on the other side had a farm, which was the complete opposite. And I lived in a little suburb that was kind of like Levittown. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of flavors of life uh, when I was very young. Um, and so what, what kind of activities were you involved in as a child? Well, um, it was a different time. So we were banished to, to the outdoors. You came home from school, you went outside to play. It could be raining, it could be snowing, it didn't matter. It was before climate change was was a thing. <laughs> so uh, we had snow in the winters, a lot of it. <laughs> it was very cold. Um, so the rule was you could go outside and play after school, or you had to go outside and play after school until the church bells rang. And they rang at six o'clock. So we would play, uh, a lot of times play baseball. Baseball's big in the Midwest. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't mean softball, we played baseball. Uh, we play in the creeks. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that if my dad hears this because that wasn't allowed because there were rats and icky stuff there. Uh, and in the drainage culverts, which are really bad if there's flash flooding, uh, they fill it with water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we weren't supposed to do that either. Um, but then when the church bells rang, we ran like hell to get home before they stopped ringing because we had to be home by six. And um, so it was pretty much a daily thing after school. And were you interested in chemistry as from what age? When did that start? Oh, well, so that's kind of different. So in my youth, men landed on the moon. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And I was pretty young. My dad made me sit up and watch it. And I kept falling asleep and he kept waking me up. Okay. And he kept saying, someday you'll tell your grandchildren about this. And I don't think I will. I think I'll be telling, should I have grandchildren? I think I'll be telling them about the manned mission to Mars. Or maybe about the men and women, men and women. Mm -hmm. Did I say that enough times? Landing on Mars. Because NASA still says we're going to Mars in 2030. So maybe in my lifetime, I'll see men landing on moon, uh, on the moon and, and men and women landing on Mars, which is really amazing. Yeah, that um, is. But when I was in second grade, my dad asked me, uh, I swear to God, Susan, because I always said Susan, just like that. What do you want to <laughs> do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be an astronaut or a professional baseball player. So my dad, you know, he was very traditional. He thought um, if you were a girl or a woman, you lived with your father until you lived with your husband. You get mm -hmm. it? Yep. Um, but he didn't say, holy cow, that's not going to happen. He said, well, if you want to be an astronaut, you have to be good at math and science. And if you want to play professional baseball, you're going to need a lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> and so um of course i did not become an astronaut uh however i have met two astronauts and i call one a personal friend dr bernard harris who was the first awesome. african-american um uh, to be on the space shuttle mission and uh, fly in space so uh, that was really amazing and i did not play professional baseball but i did play a summer of professional softball there you go cool so you know, you can have things. So let's fast forward a little bit. So where did you go for your undergraduate The University education? of Missouri, uh, St. Louis, uh, called UMSL, uh, and then some cause that other things that founded, that included UMS in them to make fun of the school. So I'm going to save you the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and did you have any influential faculty members at your undergrad? So it was an interesting time again. I was the female student in general chemistry. So wow. any of you guys who've taken general chemistry, uh, 
can you think of the number of kids in your class and being the only female? Um, and guys, can you think what it's like having the one female? Uh, which is kind of a lie because there was another one. Her name was Martha Gantner. But she and Randy Gardner uh, ran off together before the semester was over. So <laughs> then there was one. <laughs> but as far as influential faculty members, um, when I was an undergraduate, they were all fantastic, except for one. His name was, oh, I shouldn't say his name. He's still alive. Uh, he was my organic professor. And organic, uh, we're doing those. Uh, if you remember this, guys, uh, students, uh, the Fisher projections, remember that? And the Newman mm -hmm. projections. I was having a little issue with my projections. Um, and I went to ask him a question. And it was, oh, before the midterm of the semester. And he said to me in a sarcastic, annoying tone, uh, Miss Jansen, I only work with the students here for the BS degree, not the MRS degree. And it took me a few seconds to process mm. MRS being mm -hmm. Mrs. So I dropped the F-bomb right there on that gentleman. Okay. <laughs> I did. I was so angry and appalled. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was a sophomore. I had um, good grades. I was a good student. Um, and then I realized what I had done and thought I am the identi most identifiable person in this classroom. <laughs> so I went to the office where you drop courses and I dropped the class. <laughs> and um, he was quite appalled as well. So he immediately went to um, another faculty member, has a great name, Rudolf Ernst Karl Sinter. He was Austrian, um, great guy, wonderful mentor, wonderful guy who said, uh, get out of my office. I have a wife and four daughters. And I probably would have said worse. Um, and then he went to the chair of the department. And the chair of the department said, my wife, Pot, her name was Pat, but he said Pot, don't ask me why, took your class and she got an F. Is that why? Anyway, um, so a few years later, I got an alumni award and I had to have lunch with him and he apologized. Wow. And he told me that story that two of his colleagues uh, let him have it. So um, just so you know, uh, people change. And people's attitudes change. And I think the world has changed a lot since then. So anyway. All right, let's uh, go a little bit. And so where did you go for your graduate work? So I stayed at the University of Missouri. And that's a funny story, too. So uh, we had a, a guy, a PCHEM professor, who was the nicest man in the world. God rest his soul. And I wanted to do research. I was a junior. And I didn't know how to approach a faculty member or how to ask. So I asked him. And, oh, my God, he got so excited. And I didn't really want to do research for him. Good Lord, he was a physical <laughs> chemist. I thought I would make stuff in the lab, make cool stuff, uh, pretty colors, uh, whatever. Um, but nonetheless, I couldn't break his heart by saying, no, 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 no. I meant, just tell me how to do it, get in the program. Um, but anyway, in about 30 seconds, I had a key to his lab. Um, greatest guy ever. Before I graduated as an undergraduate, I had a few papers. Um, I stayed with him. Greatest guy ever. God rest his soul. Um, anyhow, that's how and I... So uh, why I stayed on at that school and how I got connected. His, uh, his PhD advisor, um, his academic father, if you will, was at uh, Washington University. So I spent a lot of time between the two campuses. Mm. It was really great. So what brought you to Temple University? Okay. So after you get your PhD, it's very common to go on and do a, a postdoctoral fellowship. Mm -hmm. So the last year of my PhD, I'm like, don't, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I've been in school forever. I think I'd need to throw in the towel and get a job for real. And just about the day I'm going to tell my advisor, greatest guy in the world, that I'm going to take a master's and go find a job, he comes down and he says, I think you should start applying for postdocs and writing up your dissertation. I'm thinking, I'm done with this whole thing. You're thinking, yeah, you're done. <laughs> So there's a little disconnect there, but um, anyhow, uh, <laughs> that's the truth. So I said, well, uh, do you have some suggestions of where I should apply for postdoc? So the first name he said, and he had other names besides this one, he said Roald 
Hoffman. That's H-O-F-F-M-A-N-N. This is important if you write to Roald Hoffman, who is still alive. Uh, he likes the two at the end. He gets very annoyed if you don't spell his name correctly. Um, anyway, Roald Hoffman had just recently received a Nobel Prize in chemistry. I figured he was going to be like, <laughs> no way. Mm. Um, I sent about 10 letters off. I got about six offers. The first one I got was from Roald Hoffman. I can't tell you how ecstatic I was mm. Um, mm. and how excited I was. So um, none of the others mattered after that. Kind of bad, right? But it's true. <laughs> so I went off to Cornell. And Roald is a great mentor. Uh, my first day there, he, you know, we had no baggage between us. We didn't know each other. He said to me, what do you want to do when this postdoc is over? I said, well, I want to be a university professor. And, he, and instead of saying, you know, those are the harder jobs to get, you have to do X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. He said, then we'll start today making a plan. That's awesome. So, um, so my postdoc was two years, but we spent the first year um, doing a few interviews, making a plan. Those schools I really don't want to go to. Um, my second year, I sent out about 50 packages, had I think 14 interviews. And at that time, there were maybe most chemistry departments for real had zero female faculty members yeah. or one. So I got lots of offers. Um, but the offer from Temple was probably the most appealing. Um, because it was real, it was a real place. Um, I liked the students, I liked the atmosphere. Temple was a very different place when I came. Okay, a very different place. Mm -hmm. And even that I, I sort of liked. I liked that the people coming there were coming there to really find a place in the world. They were coming to study and work hard. And Temple's always been that. Uh, one of my favorite uh, slogans for Temple was Temple Made. And, and the motto, um, Perseverance Conquers, that's part of the uh, alma mater uh, that we're seeing at graduation, I think really says a lot. Perseverance awesome. Conquers. But, um, anyway. I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, what would you consider as your main fault? Oh. <laughs> I, can only, I can only talk about one. No, you can. Uh, one or two. Well, I do. Up. I am a pest when I want something. I don't know if that's a fault. No, I mean, okay. And persistence. I do like to tell a story a lot. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's a main fault. I like to procrastinate. I, I now get work done by scheduling things by deadline. Uh, fault. You want to give me multiple choice? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing well in the fill in the blank. You're doing great. Here. Uh, um, what do you like to do for fun? I like music. I like hiking. I like being outdoors. In my in my decrepit uh, state, since I recently broke my leg, I like riding my bike because that way I don't put too much weight on my broken leg side. Um, what's on your Spotify list or your iPod or whatever music? Oh, okay. So, okay. What's on my music list? That's funny. It could be anything. It could be classical music. It could be Mozart. It could be, um, I don't do a lot of hip hop, but a little bit. It could be music from the uh, 70s and 80s. It could be um, Buddy Holly. It could be wow. Johnny Cash. It could be Jim Crow. Johnny Cash. Like, yes. uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it could be any of those things because I like sometimes the words of a song. I like the beat of a song. Um, I had a lot of, uh, when my kid was in high school, My Chemical Romance. Mm. <laughs> which some of the lyrics are really inappropriate, <laughs> but they were fun. Okay, <laughs> you didn't... Um, so I just like like it all, okay? What are you currently reading? What am I currently reading? That's a that's interesting. I am currently reading um, Just Mercy. Hmm. I am currently reading, I have a, an e-reader that has about 300 books on it, <laughs> uh, just so you know. Because when, when I got my first Nook, people, this is like really old, people like, that's stupid. No one will want to read a book on an electronic device. Right, right. People want to hold the book and turn the pages. Untrue for me. The more books I can load and survey. Yeah. Um, I read science-y books for classes. I finished over the, I called it, uh, I had a Christmas course, uh, the early term. Um, so I did two books with students. One was Zero, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea. Mm -hmm. Great book. If you like math a little bit, or if you just like science and math a little bit, 
Uh, I did Napoleon's Buttons. I'm um, because I read these books for a course we have, um, and I'm not plugging the course. I just love the course. It's called Best Selling uh, Science and Math. It's a special topic. So I try to read a couple of those. Um, so I'm prepared uh, when the course comes up. What excites you? What excites me. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, um, what excites me? How about what energizes me? Can I change yeah, the question? Fine. Yeah. Okay. So I have, uh, and I say it all the time, the greatest job in the world. I have the greatest boss in the world. If you guys don't know your dean, you should learn uh, about your dean. Greatest guy in the world. Um, but what energizes me is part of my job involves working uh, with young kids uh, from our local schools in science projects. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I groan about it every Saturday morning when I want to be sleeping till noon to recover from what has happened to me during the week. Um, I meet the kids every Saturday morning virtually at 830. And for some reason, 45 middle school kids show up on time every Saturday morning. I, I, I can't figure that out. And I get to talk to them. And I get to hear their viewpoints. And we talk about science. And we talk about Python coding. Um, and they say really delightful things. So this group said, can we start a company for part of our math project? So I'm a pushover, if you don't know. I prefer to say yes than no. And if I can't say yes, I like to say maybe, or can we try it another way? And Tom knows mm. that. So um, <laughs> a lot of people know that. Um, so of course I said yes, because that seemed easy. So. The kids then later said to me, and these are kids that come from North Philly, they said to me, can we donate our money back to Temple? Oh, man. And it was so touching. And I, of course, said, hell no. <laughs> you can take your money. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking, of course, the whole time, what money? What money are, are we going to make? So let me tell you what their company is. Because I said, well, what can you guys sell? You want to be a company? You have to sell something. So here are the things they are doing for their company. And the second project hasn't started yet, but the first one has. They're selling, and I think selling is maybe the wrong word, but they are producing, I'll say that, um, peer tutoring videos. Very cool. Um, to teach their classmates about things that are hard. So they're doing some peer to, uh, tutoring videos about things they found hard in math and in science. Okay, um, they're giving them, um, they do reading projects. And so they're reading right now the, the classroom edition of The Martian, uh, where instead of using the F word, they use the S word, because that's better. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, <laughs> and so they're telling little stories from that book to their classmates. Um, they believe hopefully that they will be able to, people will buy their little tutorial products. So I will probably buy their tutorial products so they can say they made some money, but because they're good and they're cute and they're sweet, right? And awesome. then I told them they could maybe when COVID lets us have a big pizza party or they could pick a, a, a different charity, not Temple, to donate to. Cool. And their, their second project is they're crocheting little blankets and things for animal shelters. And awesome. the crocheting materials are going out Tomorrow and Saturday, there's a pickup. And um, since they're making blankets, I think it's easy to crochet, but what do I know? Um, I, I, I thought that kind of thing was punishment as a child, and my father said, unless I was bad, I didn't have to do it. So um, so what do I know? But I think it's easy. Uh, Thank you. We're going to switch gears now. I'm going to do something called the rapid fire response. Give you two words. You just state your preference. Tea or oh. coffee? Oh, tea, without a doubt. Morning or night? Night. Dark or milk chocolate? Both. Offense or defense? Defense. I only dogs, or defense. dogs or cats? Dogs. Bert or Ernie? Okay. Half you know, full I or half empty? I Sesame Street. I don't know. I don't know which one is which. <laughs> half full or half empty? Oh, half full always. Hot or cold? Awesome. Thanks so much for being on our show today. Great talking to you.